The objective of this lecture is to provide the second part of the study of the orbit as a function of time. This lecture focuses on the relationship between eccentric anomaly and time on an orbit. This lecture is organized as follows. First, we're going to provide a motivation for the derivation of a relationship between eccentric anomaly and time. And then we're actually going to derive the key results. So the key results called Kepler's equation. is derived. And once Kepler's equation has been derived, we're going to provide an approach to solving Kepler's equation. And in particular, we will discuss that Kepler's equation cannot be solved analytically. So that's important, is that Kepler's equation cannot be solved analytically. So an iterative approach is developed. And that, of course, implies that the approach is numerical. So that's going to be the overall structure of this particular lecture. So let's start with a motivation for relating eccentric anomaly to time on an orbit. The motivation is as follows, is that we know that we somehow have to be able to relate position to time. So we need both the location of a spacecraft on an orbit and the time at which the spacecraft is at a particular location. So the first part is that the orbital element that provides the location on an orbit is the true anomaly. Note, however, that the true anomaly cannot be easily related to time.
Instead, it is more straightforward to relate the eccentric anomaly to time. So if we can develop a relationship between the eccentric anomaly and time, then we can actually use the relationships between the true anomaly and the eccentric anomaly that we derived in the previous lecture to be able to compute the true anomaly once we know the eccentric anomaly. So let's write that down. So then, once the eccentric anomaly is known, the relationships developed previously between the eccentric anomaly and the true anomaly can be used to determine the true anomaly. So we're going to go through this process now of deriving a relationship between the eccentric anomaly and time, because once we can get that relationship, we can transform the eccentric anomaly to the true anomaly, and then we have the quantity we actually want which gives us everything in terms of the orbital elements. So let's start with the derivation of Kepler's equation. Now remember that Kepler's equation relates the eccentric anomaly to time. So we need to use some previous relationships in order to be able to make, make this relationship happen, which is that the three previous relationships we're going to use as follows. So recall that from the orbit equation, r is equal to p over 1 plus e cosine of nu. But we also had from earlier that r is equal to a times 1 minus e cosine of e. The second relationship was derived when we actually derived the relationship between the eccentric anomaly and the true anomaly, we have this intermediate result, which we're now going to use in this derivation here. And the third relationship is the one that will actually allow us to be able to eliminate the true anomaly from the, uh, from the entire uh, expression when we're all done, which is that r times the sine of nu has to equal b times the sine of e, and that's equal to a times the square root of 1 minus e squared times the sine of e. Now this third relationship will be used once we've exhausted everything that we can in the first two relationships. And together, these three relationships will enable us to be able to develop a relationship between the eccentric anomaly and time. So these three relationships will enable deriving a relationship between the eccentric anomaly and time. Now here's how we're going to go about this. We're going to start by taking rates of change of various, uh, various equations. We're actually going to start with the second equation because it's the easiest one to start with. So first, take the rate of change of 
of r using the second equation. Above. So what do we get when we do that? We get r dot is equal to, well, if I take the rate of change, I get a times e. The derivative of cosine e is minus the sine of e, so the the derivative uh, uh, the derivative uh, negates the negative sign, so the negative sign disappears. And we end up with a e times e dot times the sine of e, because we're taking the derivative with respect to time. So that's the first of these relationships, is we have r dot is equal to a e times e dot times sine of e. So next, take the rate of change of the first equation. And what we wind up getting there is we get r dot is equal to, well, we have to be careful because r is actually equal to p over 1 plus e cosine of nu. So when we're, when we're all done with this, we get p over 1 plus e cosine of nu, the whole thing squared, times the derivative of e cosine nu, which is e times the sine of nu. But the derivative of 1 plus e cosine of nu to the negative 1 produced a negative sign. So again, the negative sign winds up canceling out. And we wind up with pe sine of nu times nu dot. So now we have two expressions for the rate of change of the radius, which is that we can equate these two then. So equating these last two expressions, we have the following. So we have a times e times e dot times the sine of e is equal to p e sine of nu all divided by 1 plus e cosine of nu squared times nu dot. Now we have to do some things to this right hand side in order to make this more tractable. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this right hand side first uh, numerator and denominator by p. So what we get is we get p squared times e times the sine of nu all divided by p times 1 plus e cosine of nu squared and then we multiply by nu dot but then i can factor out the p squared and the 1 plus e cosine of nu squared so i get p squared all divided by 1 plus e cosine of nu the whole thing squared and then what i'm, what I'm left with when i'm all done is i'm left with e times the sine of nu all divided by p times nu dot. But then that expression, I've got p squared over 1 plus e cosine of nu squared. So that's p over 1 plus e cosine of nu, the whole thing squared, times e sine of nu all divided by p times nu dot. Now, there's one other thing that we can use to be able to make this a little bit simpler which is that we know that p over 1 plus e cosine of nu, the whole thing squared, is just equal to r squared because r is equal to p over 1 plus e cosine of nu. So this becomes r squared times e times the sine of nu all divided by p times nu dot. But from earlier, we had that r squared times nu dot was equal to h, where that quantity h, that scalar, was the magnitude of the specific angular momentum. We had derived that when we were looking at the, the orbit earlier in two dimensions. So we got, that, uh, we got that result. So then what we can do is we can relate these last two expressions by first solving for nu dot, substituting it in, and then relating it to, to the first expression that we have on this page. So we then have a e times e dot times the sine of e is equal to r squared e sine of nu all divided by p times
times new dot, but new dot is equal to h over r squared, which implies that ae times e dot times the sine of e is equal to r squared e times the sine of nu all divided by p times h over r squared, from which we obtain ae times e dot times the sine of e is equal to e sine of nu all divided by p times h. But h is equal to the square root of mu times p, and that's because p is equal to h squared over mu, and again, we derived that earlier. So from this last expression, we get ae times e dot times the sine of e is equal to, we have e times the sine of nu all divided by p times the square root of mu times p. And this can be simplified further to give a e times e dot times the sine of e is equal to e times the sine of nu all times the square root of mu over p. So therefore, canceling out the e's, we get a times e dot times the sine of e is equal to the square root of mu over p times the sine of nu. Now, what we're going to do from this point is we're actually going to substitute in for the sine of nu using the third expression that we had written down originally. So then, r times the sine of nu is equal to b times the sine of e which is equal to a times the square root of 1 minus e squared times the sine of e. That was the third of the expressions that I, uh, that I had written down originally. So from this, we can actually solve for the sine of nu. So the sine of nu is then equal to a times the square root of 1 minus e squared, all divided by r times the sine of e. And we can substitute this expression into the last expression from the previous page. So we then have a times e dot times the sine of e is equal to the square root of mu over p times the sine of nu, which is equal to a times the square root of 1 minus e squared all divided by r times the sine of e. Now you can see that the sine of e cancels out from this whole thing, so we wind up getting a times e dot is equal to, well now I'm going to make a few substitutions, but before I do that let's write this simplified expression down. Square root of mu over p, that's the first thing. I have a times the square root of 1 minus e squared and then divided by r. So recall that p is equal to a times 1 minus e squared. So as a result we get a times e dot is equal to the square root of mu all divided by a times 1 minus e squared and then times a times the square root of 1 minus e squared all divided by r from which the square root of 1 minus e squared winds up canceling out and we get a e dot is equal to well, when I'm done with this, I have the square root of mu times a all divided by the square root of a, and then there's an r in the denominator, which gives the square root of mu a all divided by r. So now I can take this expression and I can rearrange it. So we then have r times e dot is equal to the square root of mu a all divided by a, which is equal to the square root of mu over a. But 
r is equal to a times 1 minus e times the cosine of e. That was one of the three expressions I had written down right at the beginning. So now I'm going to substitute that expression in. So substituting, we obtain a times 1 minus e cosine of e times e dot is equal to the square root of mu over a. So then I can divide through by a, and I get 1 minus e cosine of e times e dot is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed. Now you'll notice something that on the right hand side I have the square root of mu over a cubed and this quantity is a constant right so so let's just remind ourselves of that the square root of mu over a cubed is a constant that's important because it's going to simplify things quite a bit so what we can do is we can integrate both sides and this is where we have to be real careful with the way we do this integration so First, I can separate variables. So separating variables, we have that 1 minus e cosine of e dE is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed dT. And that just simply comes from the fact that dE dT is the same thing as e dot. So we can keep that aside too, just in case it's necessary. So now we can actually integrate both sides. So integrate both sides. So we then obtain the integral of 1 minus e cosine of e dE is equal to the integral of the square root of mu over a cubed dt plus a constant. So let's integrate the left side. Well the left side when I'm done integrating I get e minus little e times the sine of e. When I integrate the right side, I get the square root of mu over a cubed times t plus a constant. So now we have to figure out what this constant is. So let's determine the constant. Now the way the constant is determined is as follows. And this is the important part, which it has to do with the geometry, is that assume that at an initial time, we're going to call this initial time t0, that the eccentric anomaly is equal to e0. So what I mean by that is as follows, is that e at t0 is equal to e0. That's the first thing. Also, assume that at a later time, t, the eccentric anomaly, is denoted e of t. Now, we're going to use this initial condition first to be able to figure out what to, what to do next. So applying the initial condition, gives the following. It gives e at t0 minus little e times the sine of e at t0 
is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t0 plus a constant. But e at t0 is equal to e0. So that implies that e0 minus little e times the sine of e0 is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t0 plus a constant, from which we can actually solve for c. So that implies that the constant is equal to e0 minus little e times the sine of e0 minus the square root of mu over a cubed times t0. So therefore, we have, well, remember I said that we're dealing with a later time t. So if I use the later time t, I've got e of t minus e times the sine of e of t has to equal the square root of mu over a cubed times t plus this constant, which is equal to e0 minus little e sine of e0 and then minus the square root of mu over a cubed times t0. So that implies that e of t minus e times the sine of e of t is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t minus t0 plus e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. So this last result is actually referred to as Kepler's equation. This, so let's write this down. This last result is called Kepler's equation. But unfortunately, and it's not obvious at the beginning, this is not the most convenient form for Kepler's equation. What we really have to do is we have to work with, uh, with things relative to periapsis. So this is really important. Let's, let's write this down because this, this, is, this is an extremely important part of what we're doing here. So recall that both e and nu are measured from the periapsis of the orbit. But we're not given an initial condition at periapsis. Note, however, that E0 is in general not the eccentric anomaly at periapsis. If it were the eccentric anomaly at periapsis, it would have to either itself be 0 or be a multiple of 2 pi, which in general it may not be. So if I draw this picture here, here's what the picture looks like. Recall that bigger circle. And that bigger circle was the one that had the radius equal to the semi-major axis. And then we had the elliptic orbit. And recall that the angle E is measured from the center of the ellipse. So here's the center of the ellipse. And then here's the spacecraft. That point is the spacecraft. And this point above the spacecraft was what I had called A. So the angle, given that periapsis is here, this angle E is measured from periapsis. And then here's the focus, which is at point O. And that angle given that this point is the spacecraft and this point is what I had called A earlier, this angle is nu. But we may be given some arbitrary value 
E0. And so we're not measuring from periapsis. So because E0 is not equal to 0 in general, the starting point is not periapsis. So we have to figure out a way to be able to relate this to the periapsis, which is what we're going to do next. So in order to relate all quantities to periapsis, we're going to make the following substitution. We're going to say let t minus t0 equal t minus tp minus t0 minus tp, where tp is the time at which the spacecraft was at periapsis. just prior to it being at the location E0 at T0. So what I mean by that is, again, let's draw this circle. Let's draw the bigger circle. And then we draw the ellipse. So here's the center of the ellipse again. Here's periapsis. So the time TP corresponds to when the spacecraft was at periapsis. But this point E0, wherever this, wherever this is, here's, the, here's where the spacecraft is at time T equals T0. So there's the focus, and there's where the spacecraft is. And then here's the, the point on that bigger circle, which corresponds to this eccentric anomaly. This angle here is E0. So this point corresponds to T0. This point also corresponds to T0. And E0 is whatever that value of eccentric anomaly is at T0. And TP is the time when the spacecraft was at periapsis just prior to T0. So this is just prior to T0. So in other words, the spacecraft was at periapsis at TP, and then it moved to this location where it is at time T0, which is located, which is, which is denoted S. And that value S is, is the, uh, that value where, where the spacecraft is at time T0 corresponds to the eccentric anomaly E0. And of course, there's a corresponding true anomaly here, which is nu0, but we're not we're not going to be using that right now. So we're going to use this breakdown to be able to figure out how to, how to deal with Kepler's equation. So recall Kepler's equation. Where we had e of t minus little e times the sine of e of t is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t minus t0 plus e0 minus little e times the sine of e0, where, as we recall, t minus t0 was set equal to t minus tp minus t0 minus tp where I just previously had defined TP. So now let's look at each term separately. So examine each term separately. So we're going to start with T0 minus TP. So if we 
if we use Kepler's equation, so we're going to we're going to use Kepler's equation. with t0 minus tp. So at tp, the eccentric anomaly must either be zero or be an exact multiple of two pi. So that means that E at TP, which we'll define as EP, is either equal to 0 or plus or minus 2 pi or plus or minus 4 pi dot 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 whatever that happens to be but in any case it has to be one of those because we're at periapsis right so what we can do is we can apply Kepler's equation where we substitute or we replace t0 with with uh, tp and we replace t with t0 so replace t0 with tp and replace t with t0. Well, if we do that, then that implies that e0 has to be replaced with ep. And what we're going to do is, because we can pick any value for ep, because it's an angle, right? So it wraps every 2 pi. And we're just going to arbitrarily choose EP to equal 0. We can pick it to be 0, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 4 pi, whatever. We're just going to choose 0 because it's the easiest one to deal with. So now, once we do that, Kepler's equation, when we apply it, with the time difference T0 minus TP becomes the following. So then, Kepler's equation using t0 minus tp is given as we have, well, we've got e0 minus little e times the sine of e0 is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t0 minus tp. And then the second term in there is all 0 because we're evaluating it the initial true anomaly in this particular case is EP. So I can write it down if you want to. It's EP minus little e times the sine of EP. But the sine of EP is equal to 0 because EP itself is equal to 0. So that whole last part just disappears. In which case we wind up getting that T0 minus TP is equal to the square root of a cubed over mu times e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. So that gives us the, uh, the, the quantity t0 minus tp. So next, consider the term t minus tp. So again, apply Kepler's equation. And we wind up getting the following result. We get e of t minus little e times the sine of e of t is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed. But in this case, we're dealing with t minus tp but we still have the, the last part is 0. We have plus EP minus little e times the sine of EP. And again, that whole thing goes to 0, from which we wind up with e, e at T minus E times the sine at E of T 
is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t minus tp. Now we have to be really careful here how we deal with this e, e at t. And this is the part that gets very confusing. So we have to be careful with e at time t. And the reason we have to be so careful about it, as we'll see in just a second, is it has to do with angle wrap and the number of times the spacecraft has gone around. So it's possible. In fact, it's probably going to happen most of the time that the spacecraft will have crossed periapsis a number of times on its route from EP to E of T. So what that means is as follows, is that if I draw this in a diagram, if we start at EP, so here's EP, and we go one full period, then this is going to be EP plus 2 pi. If we go another full period, this is going to be EP plus 4 pi. And if we keep doing that over and over again, we will have crossed periapsis a number of times, however many times that is. And the last time we cross periapsis, this eccentric anomaly is going to be EP plus 2 pi times K, where K is the number of periapsis crossings. And then finally, after we've crossed periapsis that last time, we have this amount that takes us to E of T. Now you can see that in the process of doing this, starting at EP, which is equal to 0, remember we started at 0, we've actually gone 2 pi k radians and then some amount at the end. This amount at the end that we've gone to get us to E of T, I'm going to call that E. So you can see that the total amount at E of T, so at time T, has to equal 2 pi times k plus e. Now, what's important about this is that e is on the interval 0 to 2 pi. So we've taken out all of the angle wraps or all of the revolutions that we've gone around and we've left, us sel left ourselves with an angle that's on 0 to 2 pi. And so now we can actually substitute this expression in to the previous expression that we had using Kepler's equation. So then what we wind up with is e of t minus e times the sine of e of t has to equal 2 pi k plus capital E, which is this last part that we, that we kept here, minus E times the sine of 2 pi k plus E. And that has to equal the square root of mu over A cubed times T minus TP. But the sine of 2 pi k plus E is equal to the sine of E itself. And in order to be able to understand what E is, now, after we've done this, K is equal to the number of periapsis crossings. And this is really important because we need to know the number of periapsis crossings. So in going from this point to that point over there, this has induced k periapsis crossings. So that's where that value k comes from. So when we're all done with this expression, 
we wind up with the following result. So therefore, we have 2 pi k plus e minus little e times the sine of e is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t minus t p. And now what we can do is we can we can uh, work on subtracting these expressions, right? Because first what we can do is we can take, we can solve this for t minus tp. So we have t minus tp is equal to the square root of a cubed over mu times 2 pi k plus e minus little e times the sine of e. But we previously had t0 minus tp is equal to the square root of a cubed over mu and then this was multiplied by e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. So then we can subtract. So subtracting these last two results gives, well, t minus tp minus the quantity t0 minus tp is just t minus t0, which is what we wanted to begin with. And that's equal to the square root of a cubed over mu times 2 pi k plus e minus little e times the sine of e minus e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. Now, you can see that this angle e that I have here has to be on the interval 0 to 2 pi because I've taken into account all the full orbital revolutions by the number of periapsis crossings. So we have to recall that e is on 0 to 2 pi. And that kind of makes sense because we're dealing with an angle and generally speaking when we're done with angles we're dealing with things that are on 0 to 2 pi. Same thing with true anomaly we're dealing with something on 0 to 2 pi. So that that's a perfectly reasonable result. Now this is the full form of Kepler's equation if you really want to call it that. So you can see that this last result provides a relationship between the eccentric anomaly at time t and the time difference t minus t0. So it's a relationship between those two things. So that's the full form of, of Kepler's equation. So we can use this equation in one of two ways. So let's go into a little bit more detail on this. So let's examine this last result. which is we have t minus t0 is equal to the square root of a cubed over mu times 2 pi k plus e minus little e times the sine of e minus e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. Now this equation can be used in one of two ways is that suppose we are given e, k, and e0. Well then, we can compute or we can determine t 
minus t0. Now that's a very straightforward thing. Once you're given e, k, and e0, then you can figure out what the time difference is, right? That's not the one that's actually the most complicated. The more complicated one is the other one, is that suppose instead that t minus t0 is given. along with e0 well it, this is the case that actually is more is more difficult so you can really say along with e0 and k because we need to know k also so this is the one that's more difficult this one requires us to now be able to solve for e so then we want to determine e. So how would we do that? Well, we'd have to rearrange this equation. So let's rearrange. So we then obtain well, let's multiply by the square root of mu over a cubed. So we've got the square root of mu over a cubed times t minus t0 is equal to 2 pi k plus e minus little e times the sine of e minus e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. So then that implies that e minus little e times the sine of e is equal to the square root of mu over a cubed times t minus t0 and then we have minus 2 pi k plus e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. So now let c equal the square root of mu over a cubed times t minus t0 minus 2 pi k plus e0 minus little e times the sine of e0. So then we have e minus little e times the sine of e is equal to c. And this gets into the last part of this lecture, which is that we now have a relationship. So we know everything in this equation except for e. So everything is known except e, because that's what we're solving for, right? Because this this quantity c is a function of t, t0, but I know t and t0 because I know the difference t minus t0. I also know the initial eccentric anomaly because I have to know where we're starting, right? So basically what this relationship tells us is if I start at the eccentric anomaly e0 and that eccentric anomaly is defined at a time t0 and I go to a time t from t0, which means that I now know t minus t0, and I know the starting point. And I also know the number of times I've crossed periapsis in going from t0 to t. Then I can figure out the eccentric anomaly at time t. So this equation can then be solved, because I know everything else in the, uh, in the equation. So the way it's solved is that it's solved using a fixed point iteration. So the solution of Kepler's equation it's solved using a fixed point iteration so we're going to rearrange Kepler's equation so rearrange the last expression to give e 
is equal to little e times the sine of e plus c. Now that doesn't seem like it really does anything, but it actually does. Is that let's suppose we provide an initial guess. So I'm going to say let e at 0 be an initial guess for e. Well, then once I do that, I can iterate. So the iteration looks like this. So it looks like e at j plus 1 is equal to e times the sine of e at j plus c, where j goes 0, 1, 2, up to however many iterations I actually perform, capital J iterations. Now this last uh, iterative procedure is what's called a fixed point iteration. So this iterative procedure is called a fixed point iteration. And a fixed point iteration looks as follows, which is that when we say fixed point iteration, what we mean is that we have some equation which looks like x is equal to f of x. And in order to be able to solve that equation, we do x at j plus 1 is equal to f of x j with a starting point that x at 0 is given. And this is the initial guess. So in this particular case, we have e at j plus 1 is equal to little e times the sine of e at j plus c. Now it turns out that this fixed point iteration will converge. So this iteration converges. for e between 0 and 1, but not including 1. And if e is getting very close to 1, but it's still less than 1, the iteration converges more slowly. So it actually converges more rapidly for smaller values of e than it does for larger values of e. So as the elliptic, the elliptic orbit becomes more and more and more eccentric, the iteration actually converges more slowly. So the convergence rate. depends upon the value of e. The larger the value of e, but still less than 1, the slower the convergence. So that's how you actually solve Kepler's equation using a fixed point iteration. So that takes us to the end of this lecture, and we can summarize as follows, which is first is we provided a motivation for developing a relationship between eccentric anomaly time. And then we derived the key result of Kepler's equation.
And finally, after we derived the result of Kepler's equation, we developed a solution method. And that takes us to the end of this lecture. What we're going to do in the, in the next lecture is we're going to actually put together all of this in the form of an algorithm where we actually go through and we compute every single step to be able to determine not only the eccentric anomaly, but also be able to determine position, velocity, the true anomaly. We're going to go through a, a, lot, of, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of steps that will provide, as I said, a full algorithm for being able to, to use Kepler's equation as part of a bigger process. But for now, we'll stop this lecture.